Anna, Gabriel, Mann, and John David Mann, welcome to World's Best. Pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. John David Mann, good to see you again. Yeah, it's old friends now, yeah. Anna, lovely to have met you. I'm so happy to be here. This book means so much to me. It just, it's comes right out of the heart for both John and I, but for me, it's been, I've been waiting 15 years for this book. Well, you better tell us about the book. <laughs> um, this book was something that um, when the first printout of The Go-Giver appeared off of John's printer back in 2007. 2005. 2005, right. It was published in 2008. Um, but in 2005, when I read the first draft of it, I said, whoa. I mean, this is incredible for business, but this would make a remarkable book about relationships and marriage. And John was like, yes. You know, I mean, he was just completely, I mean, the cornerstone of our relationship has been giving. I mean, it's just, we have so many ways that we give to each other, so many ways that we attend to each other and take care of each other. And, you know, you know, the codependent community would have you believe that that's just, you know, all wrong. But the truth is when your issues have been not resolved, because nobody's issues are ever resolved, but when your issues are to the side and you're really in a relationship in a very authentic and deep way, giving is a cornerstone. I mean, it's, it's a powerful part of how you take care of one another and um, how you nourish each other, how you build each other up, how you believe in each other. Um, there's just so many facets to it. So um, during the pandemic, we were sitting around, you know, kind of watching the world go by in the isolation of our home. And, you know, we, we both agreed it was time to do it. So we sat down and really got, got, to, got working on it, developed the secrets. And then, you know, John is really, you know, he's just parables are really a powerful part of his work. And so he wrote the parable part of it, you know, the first half. Um, we did design the secrets together, um, but then the second half of the book is just comes straight from me. So it's it's a real 50-50 division. Let me jump in and say, say this, if I, if I can, Levin. Uh, you know, I, I don't know who watching right now knows the original Go-Giver that we published over a decade ago, but the little red book, the Go-Giver. The, the book is, you know, purportedly a book about business, but it's really just, it's a book about humanity. And in the middle of the book, I think it's chapter nine, there's this chapter about Joe. Joe is the hero of the book. And there's this chapter where he, we see him at home with his wife. It's the only place in the book where we see him at home, his, his, his domestic life. And um, we see a little exchange between the two of them. And the marriage is eh, mezzo mezzo. It's not terrific, but it's not awful. But it's not in a fantastic space. And they have an exchange. And he has a realization. And it's really the moment in the book when he starts to get the message of the book, central message of the book. And when Anna said this thing, um, this would be a great, you know, this would be great about marriage. It really clicked because it was in his marriage that Joe got the message of the go-giver. It was in that moment. And, and that's, so this book in a sense is the, is the answer to that question or it's the follow-up to that promise. Um, it's, it's the other half of the thought that happened in 2005. It's about the go-giver principle, which is simply this. When we call it Pindar's principle after the, the mentor in the go-giver, Pindar's principle says, the more you give, the more you have. And, and in business interactions and in sales and in, and in entrepreneurship and in so forth, it's, it's that paradoxical idea that Rather than go into the into your business life looking for what can I get, you know, what, what's in it for me? How can I take? How can I get advantage here? Which is a natural thing to think. You go into it thinking, how can I give advantage here? How can I add value to this other person's life? How can I make these other people's lives better? And you know what Bob and I were saying was that will accrue to you. That will actually increase your success. Well. It's like that in, in marriage. And it was what I was saying is we, you know, the spirit of generosity is, is, um, is what we both figured is it kind of the base of our relationship. But here's the thing. I'm not an expert in marriage. She is. <laughs> um, you know, Bob and I are both in the business world. I've been an entrepreneur my whole life. And so, you know, I've 
been a human being my whole life. I'm in rela- you have relationships with people, but but so I, I've I've dabbled in the world of people, but Anna's got this expertise. So as we started to get serious about the book, it was like, ooh, what if we brought all of Anna's background as a marriage coach, as a family therapist, and all of her sort of book smarts and 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 knowledge. Um, and, and experience in the trenches experience about this, which is which is phenomenal. And married that with this go-giver philosophy, uh, which was already out there and which is what we already live and believe. Anyway, long-winded way of saying that's what produced this book that you see hovering behind us on the hillside. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I wrote the front half, the parable. Uh, the back half is, is a very practical how-to guide for how to apply the principles of the, of the book, of the story half in your daily life. And that's Anna's domain. So she really wrote the, the, the back half and, and they were, um, and we're very excited about both halves. Well, John, plenty of people have had a, a really great opportunity to learn you about you and what you've been doing and the massive accomplishments that you've, you've achieved over the last 20 or 30 years, however long it's been. But Anna, you're a relative unknown, and I'd like to explore a little bit more about this background that, that John just touched on. Um, well, for a number of years, I was a faculty member at a university here in the US, and I just love to teach. I mean, I love to teach, but I really feel like, and I would say this to my students a lot, um, that you can never be a good therapist until you've done your own therapy. That the depth of your ability to work with a client is directly related to the depth of work that you've done on yourself. And I would have students say, oh, but I, you know, I grew up in the Midwest and I, my parents took us out for ice cream every Friday night and nobody yelled and no one was alcoholic and it was just great. You know, I don't have any dark skeletons. And, you know, I would, I would coach, not be a therapist. They all had to be in therapy on their own, but I would coach them individually. And I discovered that the very girl, woman that said that, who was quite young at the time, had actually been assaulted when she was 14. But her life, her and her childhood was idyllic. And you know, as we got to know each other better, I just, you know, I really encouraged her to go to the core of what that meant to her and to really explore that in therapy. And I got a letter from her several years later saying, I didn't even understand how deep the impact of that experience was. I had spent so many years burying it and trying to be in her in parentheses, a good girl. Um, trying to be what everybody wanted me to be, overachieving to try to overcome my sense of shame and my feelings of inadequacy. And she said, I just, it it was just so, so huge that it would have completely impacted my ability to be a therapist had I not really gone to the depth of it. And then she shared that there were other experiences that she hadn't even really considered, but that were also things she couldn't dismiss. And so once she got exploring and she really gave herself permission to go into the darkness, and that was one of my key phrases with my students is like, you know, go to the, go to the depth of the darkness because, and go in there and find out what's happening because you are worth it. And if you do not do that exploration, your relationships, your work, your marriage, and your mothering will all be on the surface. You'll be, you could be one of those mothers who makes terrific cookies, but you can't talk to your daughter about sex. You know, I mean, it's, it's that black and white. I mean, I've met mothers who were like, you know, could I talk to my daughter about oral sex? And they were like, no, you know, and it's like, well, don't you think she deserves to know what it is (laughs) and have somebody that she trusts talk to her about it? You know, it's like, it's, it's the the places where we're uncomfortable and every one of us on the planet without exception has been shamed so many times. And that is a really common feature in relationships. 
I mean, I've been shamed by friends. Um, I certainly have been shamed in previous relationships. And I think the other thing that I like to share on podcasts, and it's just us being very transparent, is that, you know, John and I met after both of us had had marriages that were quite long term explode. And so we have children and um, previous spouses. And so we're not only both divorced, but we've been together 25 years. And, you know, you learn a lot about somebody when you open the doors and you really are very transparent right from the get go. Um, so I, I just think there's so many clues to how it can how it can shift you. Each secret has its own depth um, and its own, you know, there's nothing, you know, one person referred to one secret as being sort of basic and simple. And I remember uh, responding by saying, mm, you know, for me, that's not basic at all. Um, if you go to the roots of of primary narcissism, and by that, I mean that place in you that as an infant, you know, needed to be seen and witnessed and cooed over, you know, that really, really vulnerable place as an infant. I'm not talking about someone who grows up to be a narcissist. That's, that's a very different category. But primary narcissism is where you develop your sense of being received by the world, of being worthy, of being cared for and loved. And if you don't receive that, and or it's combined with a lot of neglect, or a lot of shouting and yelling in the background, which you can't possibly process, you know, there's so many levels to how one can be harmed in the early, early years. But when you take the time to witness somebody and witness them in all of the, the different facets of who they are, their difficult places, their dark places, their, their beauty, you know, their their goodness. Um, that's when you really see somebody open up because they're, they're almost astonished that you would take the time to let them know that you appreciate something about them. My God, there's about 3 million things that I want to ask you and I'm conscious of the time we have together. So I want to make them really great. You're touching on so many points that are so close to home and off camera, I was sharing with you that my darling fiance, whose name is Anna, is the woman that I knew that I wanted to meet my whole life, but was beginning to think that I wouldn't. And I did. And John, you said something really amazing. Would you mind sharing that with us? Absolutely. You know, I, <laughs> yeah, uh, I have this belief. Well, I'll call it a belief. It's it's a truth that I that I hold and that I share when I have the opportunity, which is that the person is out there, the right person, the the soulmate. I, I don't pretend to know if there's only one or if the universe has dozens who who you know who might fit that category. There may be many, like there are many planets, <laughs> but I know that the person is out there, and, and, and there are so many people I've encountered in my life who have sort of given up on the idea that they can have a relationship. I was in that place, given up on the idea that they could be in a relationship that was the stuff dreams are made of, that uh, they settle like the wealthy person, the wealthy guy in Four Weddings and a Funeral, they settle. <laughs> um, uh, and go into a relationship that's like, okay, that's safe or that feels safe or that is, you know, it meets some needs and it's not bad, but no, no, no. The right person is out there, the soulmate, the perfect person. What you have to do in my view is become yourself, grow fully into your full expression of yourself as much as you can so that person can find you because they're looking for you. You don't have to go looking for them. <laughs> they will bump into you. Um, I think that your work is not to go hunting for the, for the soulmate. It's to go hunting for yourself is to really be. And, and, and by the way, this touches on sort of the central theme of the book, um, which really comes from Anna, which is when you work on a marriage, you don't work in the marriage, you work in yourself. Our, our approach in the book isn't about therapy couples therapy. It isn't about working on couple dynamics. Uh, the, one of the mentors in, in the book talks about how she used to be a couples therapist. 
and shifted to become a marriage coach of working with just individual. Because when you, when you want to improve your marriage, the place where you work is, is here. It's not fixing the other person. <laughs> the other person's job is to fix themselves. They handle themselves. You handle yourself. Um, but yeah, the right person's out there. Just be yourself. Well, it's so brilliant, John. And uh, Anna, I'll throw this to you in a second. Interestingly, I met Anna is not long after I finally fell in love with who I was as a person and cleared all my demons and finally accepted me for who I was. Yes. And when we did get together through some other learnings that I'd had, mainly a book by uh, Mark Manson called Models, Attracting Women Through Honesty, I said from the get-go, Anna, you can ask me anything you want as long as you're happy to hear the answer. And as brutal as some of those responses were, <laughs> It's the best thing because our relationship now is built on this this thick knot of trust. And I'd love to ask you about that, Anna. Well, I, I said giving was a cornerstone, but trust is the bottom line. You know, trust is uh, nothing can exist without it. And until you've let your partner see your darkness there, it's really hard to have trust because um, I think that it's an essential part of not only getting to know the person, but, um, you know, John went early on in our relationship, told me a little white lie one day. And I knew the instant it came out of his mouth that he had lied. I don't know. How long did I wait, John, before I told you I knew you lied? It was, it was within a couple of weeks. And, 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 you know, you didn't come and confront me. It came up in conversation a couple of weeks. I'm blushing because I remember it so well because I, I felt like I was definitely going out on a limb to say, yeah, well, I really didn't believe you when you said that. And then his face just went, you know, because it was like he, he, um, he didn't know whether he was in a moment of shame or whether it was really acceptable. And I knew that the reason he had made this white lie was it was a, a point of shame. It was a place that he just felt he couldn't quite reveal. And it was a great moment in the beginning of our relationship because, yeah, I said, look, you know, I, I just feel like I want you to know that it's okay. You know, it, you know, everybody has done something that they're ashamed of. And most of us, many, many things. So, and, or we've said, <laughs> opened our mouth and inserted our foot in, in the, at the wrong time, in the wrong moment. Um, you know, so, I mean, it just started our relationship off in a, in a very different way. And it was, it was fabulous. So, you know, I, I guess that's my response is that, you know, trust is, is how you build the foundation of the house. And then, you know, the clapboards and the, and the sheetrock and the electrical and all those other things go in later, but without that foundation, um, that's your bedrock. I should say, I should like to put in here that the, the, the structure of the book, you know, every go-giver book is structured around five ideas, four fingers and a thumb. And um, one of the five, we call them five secrets. You know, it says in the book cover, a little story about the five secrets to lasting love. And of the five secrets, one of those is about trust. Um, it, and we call it believe, believe in, in the other person, belief. And, and what we say in there is that um, one expression, one critical expression of love is that you totally believe in the core of who the other person is. It doesn't mean you think they're perfect because you know they're not, because no, nobody is, but you know, in particular, they aren't. You know that. You don't have to believe that they're perfect. You can see their flaws. That doesn't change your bottom line belief in the core of who they are. And that was what was happening for me in that moment. It's like, Anna saw me with, you know, with, with my face dirty, with my, you know, uh, uh, with, you know, my, my secret exposed with my, you know, my, my, my darkness, as she says, showing. And it didn't rattle her faith in me. It didn't rattle her belief in me. Um, and that was a very cool experience. That was an exceptional experience. That's the kind of belief that you would hope your parents had in you. Some of us experienced that, some of us didn't. It's the kind of, of faith that you want to express to your kids if you have kids. You may mess up. You may screw up royally. I may even get pissed off about it, but, I'm, but you're my kid. 
It doesn't, it doesn't sh shatter or even shake for a moment the fact that I love you and, and I just believe in you. I will always believe in you. That's what you want to say as a parent. Well, that's what we do as spouses, as partners. We just, we just believe in each other. And um, can I tell my quick story, sweetheart, about yep. writing? Tell any story you want. So here's my story. And it, we put it in the book, actually, that um, for years I was writing these books. Like, and you know the books I've written. They're all nonfiction books. Uh, parables, business books, personal development books, leadership books, blah, 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 memoirs. Best books ever. Ah, best books ever until his comes out December 10th. Um, <laughs> uh, but nonfiction. And Anna used to say to me, you would write great novels. You would be a great novelist. And to be truthful, my reaction internally was always, that's nice, but it's not true. <laughs> and I would always thank her. And I was, I, I, I pr appreciate your vote of confidence, but I didn't believe it. Um, but she believed it for both, for both of us. And she kept telling me, not in a nagging way, not in, a, in an obnoxious way, but she would just remind me every now and then, you would write great novels. And I would come to her after reading a novel that I'd fallen in love with. And I would say, look at this, I told her all about how great this book was. And she would say, that's amazing. You could do that too. You could do that better. And I'd always kind of like, it would make me, honestly, make me uncomfortable when she would say that. Cause I would like, no, it's not true. And as you know, this year I published my first novel and uh, you know, to, to great acclaim. And I, I, the, the book is dedicated to her for believing in the novelist in me all these years. I would What's not What's the name of the book, that. John? What's the name of the book? The, the book is called Steel Fear, available at bookstores everywhere. Steel Fear. <laughs> I was trying to, for those listening, I'm holding steel to my head. <laughs> steel, he's, he's, yes, steel by his ear, steel ear. Um, steel Fear, and that book wouldn't exist if it weren't for Anna's bedrock of belief in me. The, the book has done tremendously well from what I've heard. I haven't read it yet. I haven't read The Go-Giver Marriage because it's not available just yet, if I'm not yes. mistaken. When will it be available? March. It, it's available for pre-order now. And in fact, we've got a website, which is just gogivermarriage.com, where you can pre-order the book. And if you do pre-order the book, we'll give you a bunch of free gifts that are kind of cool. So that's, which I've, that's which I have now. done and the links will be in below, will, will be below. So for, for people that are salivating at the prospect of reading something that might save their own marriage, Anna, what's something really powerful in there that, that people are going to learn about keeping a marriage together? Uh, well, first, I, I, I guess I'd revisit the part of the therapist versus coach to say that um, I stopped doing uh, couples therapy, not because I didn't like being in the room with two people at once, but you spend a tremendous amount of time building trust with the clients because you can't take sides. You, um, they spend a tremendous amount of time bringing their viewpoint of the argument and the problem. And so it's, it's the, I'm right, I'm right. No, I'm right, I'm right. Um, back and forth going on. And, you know, the work can take longer than it should because they're spending so much energy, you know, trying to be right. And, and often, you know, one participant might be really willing to work on the marriage and the other one was sort of dragged kicking and screaming to the therapy. So, you know, it just has real drawbacks. When you work with somebody individually, um, you're taking apart each secret one by one and asking them to do it as homework. And, and, and that one of the things that we really stress and that I really stress when I'm coaching and all the coaches that we'll be training around the world will be stressing right at the very gate of the work is that um, this work is about you. This is about unwrapping and unwinding what you bring to the marriage. How are you behaving in the marriage? How do you bring yourself to this marriage? Because it's so easy to lay blame on the other person. Oh, you know, he snores and he doesn't pick up his clothes and, you know, he only showers every third day or, you know, whatever the beefs are, you know? <laughs> I mean, it's just so easy for people to just get in the blame game. Um, but that's actually what, not what we do. You know, it's like, if you're going to coach, um, you have to be willing to look at what you're doing in the marriage and how do you bring these particular secrets and skills to life in the marriage. So if you're not doing the homework, 
then you're actually telling me that you're not really that interested or committed in shifting things because the minute you start the homework, the, the, the tone of the marriage will shift even if the other spouse doesn't have any idea that you're doing this coaching. Talk about the first secret. Yeah, I'll go, I'll, I'll talk about the first secret. And, and I also love to, well, yeah, there's several, but um, the first secret is, is to appreciate, to, to really take the time to authentically appreciate your partner many times per day. And I ask people to make actual lists of the things they appreciate and bring them to the sessions so that we can really talk about them. Um, because if you really, you know, I mean, you fell in love with this person. There were things that you loved and appreciated about them right from the get-go. Um, and so if you can invest the time to really look at it, and it can be something like, you know, my spouse reads to my children every night before bed and they adore this time they have with him. And he's so good with them. And he reads in a really animated way and he's just so wonderful with them. It's like, you know, what would it mean for you to let him know each and every night how deeply you appreciate this, that you can hear them giggling and the sound of their voices and him doing the imitations of the animals or whatever it is in the story that it just warms and opens your heart completely and it, it makes you fall in love with him all over again. That because mothers, you know, they hold this baby for nine months and they're very attached the minute that baby emerges, that those hormones are running and that attachment is like, it's like the way hawks imprint. I mean, it's just really powerful. I mean, you would kill someone that tried to harm your child. Um, so when you have a spouse or a father who is invested in those children and who gives to them in ways that just are so good, that, that are really enrich the children, um, it, it's like, why wouldn't you take the time to tell him that often um, and tell him in a meaningful way so that it really has, has meaning? Um, you know, but at the same time, let's take it another direction. You know, I had a client who, um, and it's in the back of the book because it's not no real names, but this person gave me permission to, you know, as her husband was loading like six little boys into a van to go to little league practice. They were all in the van, the little boys. As he walked away from her, she told him he had the cutest butt and blue jeans ever made. And um, he turned around and said, mm, it's even cuter out of blue jeans. <laughs> and without missing a beat, she said, uh, consider that a date, buddy. <laughs> you know, it's like boom you know their day started off in a really sweet place because they they were using appreciating each other to flirt i just want to say too that the the you know there's sort of a, the dark side or the flip side of appreciation is, is criticizing which is so easy to do not necessarily even out loud but internally it, it's you know we, we talk about dropping the scorecard um, it, it's an, and again, I think it's a natural human tendency almost to, to start building this kind of scorecard in your head of like, you know, I'm doing all this and you didn't do that. You did this, you did that. It, it's to start kind of picking at the loose threads in the sweater of the other person is I think a natural response to stress. And we've all, we all live with stress. And the, the problem with criticism is that it, whether voiced or, or unvoiced is it starts to kind of build its own momentum. And, you know, it, it, it becomes a monster over time. Um, you, you create this, you know, this from criticism to vitriol, it can become, you know, contempt and anger and, and, and uh, you, know, you know, intractable irritation. So what we talk about is it's just as easy to appreciate as it is to criticize. It uses the same muscles. It uses the same brain power. It's just a matter of flipping. It's a question of where you put your focus. If you're looking for what's wrong with a person, you'll find it. I promise you'll find it because everybody's got them. If you're looking for what's, for what's wrong, what's to criticize, you will find it. So instead, just to flip the switch and say, I'm going to look at what I'm grateful for. Look at what I love about this person. Look at what I appreciate about this person. And you can even do that in moments when you're annoyed. You can even do that in moments when you're stressed, when you're upset about anything else. You can, if you practice it, it's a daily practice, 
you can just go, oh, I'm feeling stressed, ir irritated, grumpy, grouchy, critical, whatever, out of sorts. What do I love about this person? Just ask yourself. And then you start going down your what do I love list, your what do I appreciate list, and you go tell them something. I, I really, really appreciate the fact that you, you picked up my clothes while I was struggling with this thing over here. Or I just love the way you help me kind of sort things out. Or I love the way you look after this. Or I just appreciate the way that you help me do that. Or I just, you know, whatever the things are, I love your smile. Oh, I love, I love the way you walk into the room and the whole room suddenly starts to feel more peaceful. <laughs> Those, like criticism, also have their own momentum. That practice of appreciating, practice of looking for what you love, even if you do it mechanically, even if you just do it because we told you to and you're making a list, it starts to build its own momentum. And it builds, as, as Anna said, you fell in love with this person. Well, this is like a, a water spritzer. It keeps it fresh. It keeps it fresh and growing constantly. Well, I jumped on your Facebook, Anna, and I read something that you posted earlier today, and it inspired me to turn to my darling Anna to tell her that I loved her. And we, we do exchange that kind of uh, language quite a lot. But, you know, we, we've moved countries. We're now in Mexico. We've moved from Australia. You know, we don't know a lot of people around here. Not that that's ever stopped me, but it's, it's really highlighted the importance of having such a strong partnership because it's made the whole experience wonderful. And it's been unbelievably we challenging. Just had this, we're in this pandemic, right? It is seemingly never ending pandemic. Um, Anna alluded to this early on, you know, all of a sudden, a lot of people were spending a lot of time together that they weren't before. And, you know, they may always be doing that in one form or another. It's this thing where you got this person that, you've, that you're spending your life with it would be a good thing if we really knew how to how to use that time well. <laughs> because here's the thing, life with another person, you can look at that as something that limits you, or you can look at it as something that is a springboard for becoming a more fuller expression of yourself. You know, our view of, of a marriage, of a long-term committed relationship is that I want to treat you really well, not only because I should treat you really well and because you deserve it, because in the process, I'm going to become a much better human being. I'm going to discover myself better. I've learned more about myself through Anna than I, in, in, in 20 some years, than I've learned about myself through my own eyes in the other 40 or 50 years, you know? Um, so yeah, a, a, a relationship, if you're, if you're true to it and you kind of give yourself to it fully, it grows you into a larger person. So who is the ideal person that should be reading this book that comes out in March, 2022? I think it's, um, I honestly hope a lot of young people read it. Um, I hope that a lot of young marriages or people that are on the verge of marrying or that are, you know, in the, you know, that are fiancés, um, that are still at the beginning of the journey. Um, one of the central themes of the book is that love is a practice, not an event. I think that people want to have the kind of love that hits them like bricks and that, you know, they think, oh man, you know, I've been swept off my feet. My prince has come um, or my princess has come, you know, and now I can just settle in and I've, I've, you know, I've arrived. And, you know, they can't figure out why at year 12 or 15 or 18 or 20, that the whole thing has just gone so stale and that, you know, they're coming home from work and sitting in front of the television and hardly having conversation. And, or one of them is really the parent that does most of the parenting while the other one is the breadwinner. And the children really feel the sense of separation and tension. And they also feel the sense, the lack of connection between the parents. I mean, as, as people that are getting married and starting families, you know, you are going to model for your children what a healthy marriage looks like or doesn't look like. So 
I, I am hoping that people from all walks of life read it. Um, I'm also hoping that couples that really are at that, you know, 10 to 12 to 15, 18, you know, 30, 30, 40. <laughs> yeah. But a lot of divorces happen from, from year 10 to year 20. Yeah. A lot of people hang in there for 10 or 14 years, 16 years, 18 years. And then they, they often will say in therapy, I'm just not in love with him anymore. And it's like, okay, say more about that. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's always amazing to me. It's like, you know, well, at what point did you fall out of love? And she said, well, he stopped really talking to me by the fifth or sixth year. He really wasn't having conversations with me anymore. And you wonder, you know, okay, so what were you doing? What, what were the two of you doing to keep the love alive? You know, were there any joint activities? Did you, did you appreciate each other? Did you have, you know, were you growing yourself? Because a lot of times, you know, one person will be out in the world growing and the other person just goes to sleep and, and decides to get on cruise mode. And the truth is, if you're not growing yourself, then you really will get stale in the marriage. Um, so I see it as a book that's for people who are married, people who aren't married, people who are about to get married. Um, you know, it, it has such simple practices. And if people can appreciate that love doesn't just stay alive, it has to be kept alive. And that that is a practice, just like meditation is a practice or yoga is a practice. Um, or being a great carpenter, you know, if you're a great carpenter or a great musician, you know, what do they say? 10,000, 15, 20,000 hours to get to the place where you're really humming. Or a well, cellist. Yeah. Or jealousy, for example. A cellist. I mean, I, I um, Not jealousy, yeah. cellist. <laughs> yes. It's always room for jello. And jello. He, has to, he has to practice regularly to keep his fingers, to keep his so-called chops alive. You know, and that's the truth. You know, you can be a great um, cellist, but if you give the instrument up for 10 years, you're going to have to spend six months just getting your fingers back in shape. Um, so, yeah, so that's, I think it's such a broad category. And the book is, and I know I'm biased, but the book is so charming. Um, and I really do look forward to you reading it. And, um, you know, certainly we can send you a pre copy. Um, but it's, it's like, I, I feel like it, it, there's so many, um, there's so many nuggets of gold in the book that I, I look forward to seeing how people greet it. Well, for anyone that's had any exposure to the go giver book series, me personally, I wish I had more time and, and we will do this again once the book's been out, cause it'll evolve. And I'd love to have you back on to explore this more because this subject is so fascinating to me as the child of multiple divorces and every other person in my family has been divorced. But I expect this book to be as brilliant as I know it's going to be. <laughs> and, and we are so grateful that you are putting this out into the world. Do you have any concluding thoughts today? Go ahead, John. I know you do. <laughs> well, um, I, I have I have so many. You know me, Laban. I, I always have lots of lots of thoughts. It's hard to hard to make a concluding one, but you know I will say this: the you know the book has a has a story half and it has a how to have. It's food for your right brain and food for your left brain. It's you know people who want to want to take take their uh, take their medicine in story form and and want and who want to be informed in in a in a practical hands on form. Um, one thing I don't talk about that much in the book, but that is. Uh, I think it's really important to make your partner laugh. I think it's important to keep it light. I think it's important to that it's fun, that it's, you know, there's, we hint at this in the book, but one of the secrets to our love is that I see the eight-year-old in Anna. I see it really clearly. I see it all the time. And I'm constantly coming up with ridiculous kindergarten level six-year-old humor to, to just pop at her, to get, to get that little girl out. And it's, she laughs at the stupidest jokes. It's just great. She, I think the reason I love her so much is that she laughs at, at jokes, even that are so dumb, nobody else would laugh at them. I don't even laugh at them, but she does. And I just, I love her dearly for it. So I'm going to, I'm going to keep doing it when the camera's off. 
<laughs> you, and for, you, I have a last I have a last moment as well. And this is actually one of the last things we say in the book, because he, he talks about laughter and the need to keep laughter alive. Um, and I talk about intimacy in the bedroom and the importance of keeping it alive, because um, a lot of the time in my coaching, I really let women know that men are often waiting for you for, to give them the signal. They really are, you know, and, and yes, they may be making it clear that, you know, they're up, they're up for it, <laughs> but, you know, they are waiting for you to say, all right, let's go. Um, and that women, for whatever their reason, you know, kind of divorce themselves from the experience. And I, I believe it has so much to do with trauma, shame, the way that we've been shamed about our bodies, the way that we've been told that we're too big or too fat or too this or too that. Um, I just think there's so many levels to the way that we have not been um, given permission for intimacy to be just a beautiful, wonderful, natural thing. And so, and, and, and as well, you know, and, and we are, we do have silver hair. Um, and I, I like to tell people, you know, it's like, if you shut it off at 50 or 55, you know, and decide that, you know, this is it, you're hanging up your boots. Um, you know, it's like hanging up your boots. I like yeah, that. You're, you're going you're gonna to miss so many opportunities for just laughter, um, playfulness, just so much intimacy. And so that's the other piece that I guess I would leave as parting, a parting piece is that, you know, some people say women are the relationship masters of every relationship. And they certainly, you know, I think feel very deeply and but it, this is not to dismiss men and their feelings because a lot of men um, have been taught to hide depression they've been taught to hide their feelings they've been absolutely programmed so um, i just think that you know working on all those levels of your relationship are just extremely important just keep that love alive and and nourish it just it's like a a living plant that's growing and you you're the one that's providing the water and the fertilizer and the and the love and again where can we find this magical book <laughs> it is it is right now available for pre-order it's coming in march um and it will be everywhere you know from amazon to little independent bookstores around the corner uh you you name it you'll find it go give her marriage and, yeah you can find it on our website at www.gogivermarriage.com and the pre-order, um, there's gifts that if you pre-order, there are special gifts. We're doing a master class on, on uh, tension and, and uh, you know, diffusing it. And uh, so we have other, other gifts as well, so. Well, I've registered for mine, I've pre-ordered mine, and I will see you on that master class. Ladies and gentlemen, John and Anna Mann.